Uh, good, good evening, everyone. My name is Terry Swartz Russell. I'm the Director of Family and Adult Education at Temple Emanuel. And we're thrilled to be here tonight um, with a wonderful speaker, um, John Rosenberg, who is going to be introduced by Steve Thompson. I just want to give you some rules of the road. Um, we are recording this session. Um, if you do not want to be on screen, uh, you should, um, you know, stop your video. Um, and also, we're going to be muting everyone except for the speakers. And uh, John, as you can see, is going to be sharing his screen with us. And at the end, we'll um, get rid of the share screen and we will um, take questions and answers. So without further ado, I want to thank Steve Thompson for bringing John to our community to teach us. And I also want to um, thank Stan Steinberg for organizing this with Steve and bringing our muddle group together, our March of the Living group and everybody else who has an interest in tonight's topic. So Steve, take it away. Thank you, Terry. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce John Rosenberg. Um, I, I've already worked with John um, and, and preparing, uh, helping him prepare uh, his talk and presentation to our, our students from the uh, McCor High 385 classes back in December. And um, I've spoken with John maybe three or four times, and each time I do it, it's um, it is a delight. He is he has a wealth of information and a history, and to share a life story that is uh, is truly wonder fascinating. Um, he was seven years old when he left Germany, but he was he was a witness to Kristallnacht on November 9th and 10th of uh, 1938. And he's going to tell us about his childhood and his experiences during the course of the Holocaust and probably touch upon um, how that affected his life choices in terms of careers uh, and working uh, to serve mankind, humankind. Um, I do wanna just make mention that uh, that John has uh, asked us to, uh, anyone who would like to make a donation to HIAS, uh, which is the group, the Jewish group that helps immigrants um, and refugees um, to be settled. And uh, that was very active during World War, uh, World War II. So- Holocaust survivor. Uh, everyone can be muted. Okay. Um, so without further ado, John, it is my pleasure, take it away. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I don't, don't see many of you because of the, uh, I've got this little PowerPoint on the screen, but I uh, appreciate having the chance to be with you. <clears throat> I'm, uh, this is my wife, Jean, uh, it's behind me. We've been doing this, not this, evening, but we've been married 54 years, and we are, we are coming to you from Prestonsburg, Kentucky, which is a small community in eastern Kentucky near the West Virginia border in the mountains of Kentucky. Um, and uh, you want to say, what, what are you doing down there? And uh, <laughs> I'm a lawyer, and there's a part of the story that we can get to. We've been here almost a little over 50 years. We came for a couple of years uh, because when I came to uh, start a legal services agency to provide free civil legal services to low-income people, folks call it legal aid. It's also called legal services. And a lot of the poverty issues in this part of the world created by the single economy of coal, coal mining that came in uh, in the late 1890s and and then has been the bane and <laughs> been up and down for what over a hundred years now and is going to as you well know uh, because of its uh, fossil fuel it's going down but um, I can talk a little more about that and the work we do at, as lawyers in the civil in that field, I also sit on the Public Advocacy Commission in Kentucky, which uh, oversees the public defender system. So I'm a, uh, I'm a lawyer and have been, spent most of my life as a lawyer in public service. 
but this evening I will want to focus on the Holocaust. And I just thought I would begin by, at least by telling you that there is a book called, there are many books obviously about the Holocaust and you can Google a lot of information. There's a book that is called, This is Home Now, um, which was written or edited by Arvin Donahue. Arvin worked in the Holocaust Museum in Washington DC for several years and then decided when she came back to Kentucky, which is her home, uh, she was interested in what Holocaust survivors were doing, particularly in smaller communities, smaller than New York or Washington, some are in, in this book or in uh, Louisville. So she, this book includes interviews of about 11 or 12 of us. Um, it turns out that if you, you'll recognize the fellow on the cover, it turns out to be me. I didn't ever, they did that as a little bit of a surprise even though Jean, my wife, the pictures of me in here are not her favorites. But in any event, you can get it on Amazon. This is home now. And um, I, I just heard from Marvin, it's coming out in paperback next year. It's been out for probably 10 years. Uh, so I wanna go ahead with the major part of this program. And I'm being a lawyer, sometimes people, we can go on longer than necessary. And, Gene would say, start giving me, maybe we'll ask Steve to say, John, you've talked long enough um, wherever you are and maybe we should just stop. But so this is uh, what I'm gonna show you while I'm talking um, is uh, the, a little presentation that I put together primarily for school groups. So you'll see here the, is a map, a very rough map of <clears throat> Germany and the surrounding countries. And then the major uh, points that I want you to, us to be familiar with here on the Dutch border is the little town of Leer, L-E-R, -E which is a seaport on the coast. And that's where my father was born and his family and his nine brothers and sisters. I'll show you the photograph in a moment. And then the X here is Idar Oberstein. This is the place where my mother was born and where she uh, was going to school when my father showed up and took her away, eventually. And then Frankfurt is, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with these situations, is where one of my sisters lived uh, that I spent time with while my uh, father was in the concentration camp uh, during I served several years as a navigator in the Air Force and was stationed in England and during the 50s during the Korean War and was, uh, went back to Frankfurt. We, we flew into Frankfurt a number of times. And then this is Magdeburg, about, about 60 miles south of Berlin. Uh, and that's the, where I was born. So just the geography, um, Magdeburg was a large uh, metropolitan center of about 300,000 industrial center, which was badly bombed or seriously bombed during the war. And you'll see, I have a photograph of what it looked like after the war that you'll see. Um, so with that history, um, I want to we'll just begin. This is a photograph, which is probably, which probably many of you in this audience have similar photographs of their with their grandparents or their great grandparents <clears throat> taken picture about 1900. My father was born in 1901, so this is a little bit off. But this is my grandfather, Meyer Rosenberg, and my grandmother, Teresa. She, her maiden name was Wexler. She was, uh, her father was a rabbi and her grandfather was a rabbi. So a very uh, religious family and uh, then she's holding me uh, when I was with her father. Oh, and she's holding, right, she's <laughs> holding my father, thanks to you. Um, looks like me a little bit, but not much. And then my dad, and then I think this is either one of these two was his older brother, Sam. So I also show this uh, locally because I think in Eastern Kentucky and many rural areas around the country, maybe even urban areas, 
people uh, do um, think back, they, they have large families with family names and uh, that are in this area, there are lots of folks named Stumbo and Tackett and Hall. And I, I tell them if you go to the cemetery in Lair, Friesland, you will find lots of tombstones with Rosenbergs. Of course, they're all gone. There, are, there is no, there, there's no, there really are no Jewish families left in Lair. And I'll talk a little bit. We have been back. She, uh, I was back with some, some of my members of my family a few years ago. But um, so that's the Wexler and Rosenberg cousins. I mean, we, are, we can identify a few more of those, but I don't think we need to this evening. So this is my father and his brothers and sisters. Uh, this is my dad. It says about 1920, that may be right. He was born in 1901. He looks a little older than 19 to me. Um, and I can't, I'm not sure where the caption came from. Might have been from my brother or sister. But uh, he, this, uh, he lost this brother at a younger age before the Holocaust. Um, so there are nine. This is uh, yet, yeah, this is Ola. These two were the youngest. This is Yetta and Martha. They both married short, uh, in the 30s and went to, I know Yetta came, was on her honeymoon and Martha came right afterwards. And they both, they married uh, Jewish men from his families from Holland. Yetta became a van der Weyck and my Martha became a de Vries. And uh, they made it to the United States. And we'll talk more about that. This is Ellie, the wonderful the, the sister who went to Frankfurt, married, got married and uh, moved to Frankfurt. This is Ola who went to Israel, uh, Palestine at the time and moved with her husband to a Moshav. They had a son my age who was in most of, in several of the wars. He was an auto mechanic, so he kept being pulled into take care of vehicles and tanks. And uh, I visited them when I was in the Air Force and Jean and I went back and saw them um, together a few years ago. And uh, let's see, Lena, Ellie, I think, Ola, and um, I'm missing, um, Ellie's family didn't make it. This, oh, um, gotta remember, one of the, one of the daughters went to Rotterdam and uh, oh, her name, I blank the name for the moment, but she married a businessman and I'll talk about more about that family. They had four children and went to Rotterdam and <clears throat> we will meet them again. My father, Come back to this in a minute. Maybe I'll just leave it, show it to you at the moment. I have this is a copy, of the first page of the phone directory, telephone directory in Magdeburg. I uh, think it's a good piece of evidence for folks uh, who are Holocaust deniers. At least what I'm tell people, what I talk about is true as best we can tell. Um, you'll see up here, you can't read that, but in the phone book, it says Rudolf Rosenberg, lehrer, teacher, the street of school, the name of the street we were on at that time where the synagogue was located and the telephone number. So you now it's a little bit out of order. Uh, this is a photograph that uh, is also, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but um, this is my mother walking, my, walking me and my brother uh, in the park um, in probably, uh, probably when I was, I looked like, as you'll see later, about 1936, when I was five years old. And the point is to show what a nice middle class life they were living. So um, my dad, whose picture I'd already showed you, and as I said, got a little ahead of myself, he, um, he lost his father uh, when he was, I think, in high school. And uh, because the family was so large, his father, whose picture, who uh, 
you know what I do misidentified, ran a, a junkyard and then they had an antique store. And so when, uh, when he passed away, life was very difficult for his, to, for his wife, for his widow to trace her to, to take care of this large family. And so my father was actually went to an orphanage in Hanover for a few years and then entered the college system slash seminary in Hanover and trained there to become a Jewish school teacher. And uh, they actually, um, we, we asked him, well, why did you, were you thinking about going on to become a rabbi? And he said it would have required him to have three more years of education uh, akin to uh, you know, the rabbis in the congregation, most of them were referred to by as a doctor. The rabbi in our congregation was named Wilda, and people called him Dr. Wilda. It was like a, having a PhD in his country. So in any event, he, uh, when he finished uh, his coursework, his assignment, first assignment was to go to my mother's hometown of Eder Oberstein, I pointed out to you. And so he went there to teach religious school classes. And in his, uh, in that community and also in the neighboring communities, uh, the, the, the uh, Jewish school teachers, and I don't, and I think rabbis as well, tried to serve Jewish families in the smaller communities where there was no synagogue as best they could. And they would travel, you know, within the limits of their ability to do that. And uh, my mother's father, Siegmund Shuvach, her, her maiden name was Shuvach. I don't know, it's not a common name in this country, but her dad was a butcher also. And he had a small uh, slaughterhouse right next to their store. And at the time he, this was a, Peter Oberstein was a small, relatively small town. It was actually a, the industry there was the was uh, mining of semi-precious uh, stones like agate. There's a very nice museum, precious stones uh, in that community. But because the Jewish community was small, he didn't feel he could have a kosher butcher shop. So he was, was not kosher and he actually uh, slaughtered pigs as well as uh, cattle. But uh, he had a going business with a large uh, group, and he had between the slaughterhouse and his own store, he had a number of people working for him. So his mother and my mom had two, uh, two sisters. And so the family did, the, his wife primarily did the cooking for this large group twice a day. And my father started taking his meals with them. And, uh, and at the, that point, my mom was about 16. And so he got to know her quite well. And uh, long story short was that uh, two years later, uh, they, were, they were married. In the meantime, my father had um, applied for and gotten a job in Magdeburg as a, both as a Jewish school teacher and he also worked uh, in the Jewish welfare uh, office uh, in the afternoons, uh, teaching classes in part to, to members of the congregation and other Jewish members in Magdeburg who were interested in going to Israel. Um, so they, when, uh, when they first moved, they, they moved to from Peter Oberstein to uh, the outskirts of Magdeburg, a little suburb called Krakow, uh, which, um, and, and had a very nice apartment there. I was born and lived and they had, and they had a small, was, that's where they had a very nice little apartment. That was one of the areas that was not bombed out and we were, and it's been sort of rehabilitated and people are living there again. And we did go back to that area to see it. But uh, then my dad uh, decided and obtained an apartment 
in the building, which was right next door to the synagogue itself. Uh, the synagogue was a fairly large building and we have a photograph some of the damaged parts of it. But, um, but they then uh, moved to that, to an apartment upstairs there. And there was a courtyard out front uh, where I learned to ride my bicycle and the, uh, the uh, things were going uh, reasonably well. I mean, one of the reasons I put this photograph up is you'll see is that mother uh, was dressed very nicely. They had a lot of friends. There were a young, relatively young couple uh, living a nice middle-class life in Germany, in the community. Um, I think they were fairly protective of me and my brother. Uh, people often ask you know, how, what my memories are of those days when Hitler's laws started to make things so very difficult for uh, <clears throat> Jews who were in the community. You've all seen the boycott signs on the stores and that uh, as the 1930s moved on, uh, Hitler's stranglehold on the Jewish community became, became uh, more strong, stronger and stronger. Uh, I would, if you have not seen it and have an opportunity to do so, PBS did a recent series called Rise of the Nazis. I think it's a three-part program. And I, it's really quite fascinating because it really documents how many times how Hitler, who had been in prison, as all of you know, I'm sure, and wrote Mein Kampf, that after he came out, he sort of manipulated his way up. I mean, he was really, anybody who thought he was stupid is, would be wrong, and he politically moved up the chain. And it didn't happen overnight. And uh, this series points out how well, easily he could have been stopped, but the politics of the time, and there were some very, uh, some lawyers who wanted to take him on, uh, or not him personally, but who were concerned about the, uh, and put cases together about Jews who had been picked up by the Gestapo illegally and were making, had cases against them, but they were stopped by their superiors who were afraid to rock the boat. So uh, life became worse. And, and many Jewish families, of course, including my, uh, my father's, my grandfather on my mother's side, the butcher shop, they came, they like many other Jewish families, uh, came to the United States, I think around 1936. So they had, all, they had moved here. And my father's two sisters had come to this country but and he was among, my dad was, I think, among the last to realize how that this was really going to be, as, you know, that Hitler, there was, there was not going to be any way ahead. If you're going to have to get out of the country if you're going to have any safety at all. Um, I remind people that, uh, that uh, many Jewish men fought for the Germans in World War I. And uh, we have a photograph of my mom's father, my grandfather's East one, in his germ in his uniform, um, with his helmet and pointer on it. Uh, I don't have it here. I probably need to really do a better job of making this, putting more photographs in here. We don't have very much of my mother's family at all. Um, but uh, in fact, I don't know, my brother, I think the photographs are somewhere between the three of us that, that are left. But, um, but the point is, I think that when Jews fought for Germany, the overriding attitude before the 30s, before Hitler started to make things really bad, was that uh, they were Germans and their religion was Jewish. They were Jews and you could be an Episcopalian or a Baptist and, or any other religion. And it just started uh, getting worse as Hitler became stronger and stronger. And uh, 
I know that uh, uh, we, we learned that uh, there was a young man uh, when, when the Holocaust, when things got underway and Jews wanted to get out of Germany, some went to South America, as one of my aunts did, some went to, and quite a large number went to Australia. You may have seen on uh, PBS did another documentary about the Jewish community in China. And, um, but, um, so my father went to Berlin and finally, and stood in line for a couple of days to get the proper, to get a visa and the other papers that were needed, including uh, if you could show you had a ticket to get on a ship, which he eventually sold, but he finally did that. And he had this paperwork uh, together. So I, uh, so in 1936, I think, or 37, uh, Hitler uh, decreed that Jewish children would no longer be in school with non-Jewish kids and segregated the schools. And my father and one other, uh, one other member, one other teacher started the Jewish school, uh, opened a Jewish school for kids in Magdeburg. The, um, let me see. So that's what I looked like on the first day of school. Uh, I tell children, this is just to say in, Europe, in Germany, even in those days, the first day of school was a big day. And uh, you received one of these, or I think families who could afford it, certainly, and mom and dad could uh, give you a big, uh, they call them, I remember them being called Easter Twitter, which is Easter uh, the Easter bag, an Easter cone, and those are filled with goodies and school supplies. So I'm a happy young fellow to go off to school. And actually, I was going to my father's school. Um, when we we learned later that that the, uh, that uh, a lot of the Jewish families from Magdeburg who were able to get out went to Australia, and the, a young man. Uh, did a PhD thesis by doing oral histories of the Magdeburger Jews. And in those oral histories, for the first time I saw many, several of those folks who were older by the time they were interviewed, uh, talked about the nasty songs uh, that the teachers and non-Jewish kids would, would, uh, would sing about uh, the, the Jewish kids in the school. So it was no longer a pleasant place to go to school. It was probably the only way they were, kids were gonna be uh, happy in school at all. So my father uh, is a teacher and we are living in this apartment uh, next door. He was really a um, well-known in the community. I tell this, uh, I'll, You'll understand this a little bit later in a few, few minutes. But uh, at one point, one of the representatives of either the Jewish Federation or the one of the agencies that uh, that supports uh, Jewish causes in Germany came to Magdeburg to raise some money, and the fellow asked locally to the Jewish to, to the rabbi or others. Uh, who if they could identify someone who would be willing to go fundraising with him and who knew the wealthier people in the community and who would be the better people to go see. And they said, well, sure, go see Rudy Rosenberg. And so, and so he, I've forgotten his name at the moment, but in any event, he, he and my dad then spent several days together um, raising, visiting people in Magdeburg and raising money and then he went back to I think Berlin and that was the end of it for the, for that period of time. Um, just another side like well I'll tell you in a moment. So we were uh, that brings us to Crystal Night uh, November 9th 1938 and uh, we were living in this apartment next door to the synagogue upstairs in the during that night, about midnight, I think, the Nazis pounded on the door and, uh, 
and brought us out, told us to come out in our, I think we were all in our sleeping apparel and went out to uh, into the courtyard. And uh, there the rest of the group started, went into the synagogue and brought the prayer books out and uh, started a bonfire out there. And my mom was holding my brother in her arms and I was, and she, I had, she held me by what with, with one of her hands. And uh, there was one of these Nazi goons there holding his rifle or whatever. And, and she asked him uh, if they were going to kill us, and, uh, uh, which I thought was a very gutsy thing to do. And he said his answer was he really, he didn't know. Um, but uh, they didn't. And eventually, but uh, they, we were told that they, they, they dynamited, then they, I didn't say, they dynamited the inside of the, of the synagogue. Most of the synagogues, as you all know, I'm sure, were burned down. Um, in this case, then the one in Laramont was also burned down. I think the big synagogue in um, Frankfurt and in Berlin was burned down. They were been rebuilt, I believe. The one in Berlin was rebuilt. Um, but apparently this uh, synagogue was next to a hospital and they were afraid if they burned it down, they might also damage the hospital. So they let us go back into the apartment when they were, had finished. And um, we went upstairs and we went back. And this is, I just show this is a picture of the ark. Uh, there are some photographs here. And this is what the synagogue looked like uh, the following day. And I tell groups, I, I do really remember this quite well. I hadn't seen the picture. I just remember the next morning going, going you know, into the synagogue and, and remembering the upstairs had caved in from the dynamite and things were, looked as bad as they did. Um, but then I think there are some Here's some other pictures of the damage to the offices. Now, these uh, photographs, if you wonder where they're from, uh, my nephew teaches at the University of Oregon. My brother's son uh, became good friends over time. He's been over several times. and He's a historian and has, been and has done a lot of writing, not necessarily about the Holocaust, but uh, but is very, has been real interested in the family history. I met the archivist in Magdeburg. And I think the, that archivist had those pictures and most of the information that we know about that period. So he's, that's where this photograph was from. So the next morning, then when we went back upstairs to into our apartment, things had been uh, pretty badly damage it was almost unlivable i think my even the commode was had been destroyed so uh, they put, had put a mattress on the floor in the kitchen uh, for me to sleep on uh, which i did and i remember the next morning when the door when there was a knock on the door and it was uh, one of these nazis one of the stormtroopers had come back or uh, Gestapo to arrest my father. And uh, usually I tell people like a good Jewish mother, my mom said, can you wait a few minutes because I want to make, make him a sandwich. And, uh, and he waited a little bit, but then he took my father down the street and mom finished her sandwich and finished making the sandwich and gave it to me and said, run after your father and give him this sandwich, which I did, and followed them up the street. And uh, he was being accompanied by this fellow. And they took my father and some other 120, 125 Jewish men that they had rounded up in the community. And they took them to jail and to the j local jail in Magdeburg. Of course, they all thought they were coming back home that evening. and. Uh, they were crammed apparently into a couple of cells. It must have just been a terrible ordeal just to be there those two days. But but then they ended up 
taking them all to Buchenwald and uh, where they ended up for a little over two weeks. Now, my, at that point, my mother uh, took me and sent me on the train to uh, Frankfurt to be, be with my father's sister. At that time, they had a young son named Booby, who was my age, and we had played together there. We'd been to Lair together, and so you know we knew each other. And then she took my brother, who was a little over two years old, to the apartment, to some a friend's apartment, who had previously lived upstairs above us, and uh, in in the uh, near the synagogue and. They had a daughter who had been a babysitter for us, uh, primarily for my son. And so she left him with that family. And interestingly enough, that family, uh, they were Jewish. Um, they, had a, they had two children, a babysitting daughter and a young boy, a younger son named Arno. And they sent Arno to the United States on a kinder lift you're all familiar with along that point there were many Jewish kids who were being sent to England and other places and the young Arno was sent to a foster family in Detroit and he subsequently joined the army and was with Patton in Europe and then on then he went back to England and was with the RAF and met his wife and they were married and came went back to Detroit and uh, in Detroit, uh, they had three daughters. And uh, this is sort of more of a local story, but it turned out that two of those daughters, uh, they're our older now, ended up in Kentucky. And we didn't know that until very recently. That uh, they, I got an email from one of them out of nowhere a couple of years back. But um, and so that family, um, so we've been very good friends ever since. It turned out that the family, uh, the, the sister apparently was sick at the time the kinder left went. So she stayed with her mom and dad. And uh, unfortunately they were uh, killed. There's some correspondence back and forth, a letter from her father, uh, from his father to him that uh, the girls had uh, kept and sent to me in which he had been a bit earlier, I think he'd been a businessman. And at that point, he writes that he's only a laborer and he doesn't think they're going to live much longer. It's a very teary sort of letter. He didn't know whether he would ever, he hadn't heard from his son in some time. The war had started, but um, the connection to that family and, uh, and the babysitter was, was something that we learned about very recently. So my father was sent to Buchenwald and uh, uh, with, along with a lot of, as I mentioned, several of these other, about 125 other Jewish men. And they were there for uh, 16 days. And then they were ordered to get, they, they had 30 days to get out of the country. Now, another interesting thing is that during that period, uh, rabbi, the rabbi I mentioned earlier, whose name was Wilda, kept a diary, uh, not a very extensive one, but he kept a diary. And uh, on one of our trips back to Germany, my Jean and I took my mom back uh, oh, a few years ago, maybe 10, 20 years ago, to Magdeburg, maybe 30 years ago. <laughs> she starts losing track of time. And uh, while we were there, there was actually, a. Uh, you'll see on one of the photographs, I'll show you later, the city was really damaged, but one of the buildings that survived was a cathedral. And they were having, and it was almost untouched. And they were having a, a, a uh, while we were visiting, there was sort of a non-denominational Christian festival. And we were going around from booth to booth uh, just talking to people and they told us about that there was actually there was an inter there was a exhibit to the Jewish community uh, in a building nearby and we went down there and looked 
and there was a large wall-sized photograph, the interior of the synagogue, and a number of uh, different items that had been collected from Jewish families. I don't know if they'd written Jew Jewish families from Magdeburg, but one of the items under a glass case uh, was this diary that Rabbi Wilde had kept. And uh, it was under a glass case, so I could only read the first page. And it was in German. And uh, later on, the uh, entire diary made its way over to Australia so that this young PhD that I was telling you about uh, had access to it and translated it into English. And, uh, and then my cousin got a, my nephew got a copy of it. And when, when you read it, uh, I mean, there are just little paragraphs, it's probably eight or 10 pages long, uh, but one of the uh, things that it always uh, touched me was that the rabbi relates uh, that he had really lost all of his strength because they hadn't been given any food. I think on some days, all they did was stand all day long. They were treated very badly, treated uh, really badly. So he recites that one night, uh, late at night, one of the congregants came to sit him and said, Rabbi, we had somebody who got a cup of tea and I've got a teaspoon of tea here. And uh, so the rabbi took this teaspoon of tea and he, he swished it around in his mouth. And he said it was just the most wonderful thing that he'd ever tasted. And he said later on, the rabbi Wilder made it to Amp to England. He got out alive. And he said every afternoon when he um, when he took his tea in the afternoon, he always remembered that day when he had that one little teaspoon of tea that he kept in his mouth as long as he could. Uh, the other thing about Rabbi Wilder that's so, uh, that I, I always remember very much is that on that last day when they were told they were being, they were able to get out. And I am asked, often, well, how do they get out? I thought they killed all the Jews. Well, it, this is in the beginning and it was not the final solution had not been put into effect. And uh, so they were, you may not remember there, I think was even a plan to send the Jews to Madagascar, get them out of Germany. So um, um, the, uh, so Rabbi Will, so they, on, as they were leaving, you know, many of these, they were, sh they were shaving all the hair off their heads. And they told Rabbi Wilda had a long beard. And they wanted to cut, told him he, wanted, he had to have his beard cut off along with his being shaving his head. And he said to the fellow, don't cut my beard. Ask your superior if I can keep it. And the guy said, no, I he said, okay. And his superior said, no, you have to have your beard cut off. And he said, well, can you ask your superior? And this went on for a couple of more. Right? And finally, as they were being released, there was an announcement over the public address system by the camp commander that said, Rabbi Wilder will be allowed to keep his beard, which I thought was always something I, I, I'll never forget, and really quite something. But um, about 25 of their 125 men did not get out. Some ran into the electric fence, some went insane. I mean, it was a very difficult period. Uh, my dad never really wanted to talk much about it. He only thing he would really say was that he was determined to live through this. And, uh, and he did. And so then uh, we, there were, as I said, they were given 30 days to get out of the country. Um, this is the uh, document in Glossenschein that shows Rudy Rosenberg came on the 11th of November. You know, that was two days later when they got into, were taken to uh, Buchenwald and the 27th is when they were released. And um, had that, that we know those. We know those dates. Um, 
So from there, my dad and my mother then decided they would go to Holland to Rotterdam where the other sister uh, was living uh, with her family. They weren't gonna move in with them, but the Dutch government at that point had opened several detention centers. There were other Jews in Holland and from other European countries that wanted to come to Holland, where, which was a safe haven for a few months until war broke out. And so we ended up in what I call a sort of a detention camp, detention center. In our situation, it was the overnight hostelry for people who wanted to come to this country on the uh, Holland America line. Uh, and so if you had a nice cabin, if you were going first class, you'd have a nice overnight cabin that were really just very small. And I think up there, the first class was probably a little bigger. In our situation, we were in a little, little cubicle about probably 10 feet square in which there were two bunk beds on one side for my mom and dad and on the other side for my uh, brother and for me. And uh, that's where we were living. Uh, my father saw all these kids running around. He didn't have any, and they didn't have anything to do. And so he started a school for the children in the detention in the center and on his own, didn't have any materials. But, um, uh, and my mom and the women did the cooking uh, there was a large uh, hall, large eating hall. I don't know. And normally, I suppose, when it was functioning, they separated people who were on different classes in the ship or, or whatever. My, it was interesting. They had a big sign on the wall in seven languages. And all it said was, don't spit on the floor, um, which must have been an important prohibition at that time. But we, we stayed in this camp for... It were, uh, for almost a year, um, my we we were allowed to go out. We visited. There was really they didn't have any money, so it wasn't in particular do. In fact, for at one point, my mother babysat uh, her for the family. His name was Mesher. And I'll think of the and he, my father, sister, and her three children. She was pregnant at the time. And so we would see them from time to time. But um, then as uh, things got worse, then my father received, uh, told that since he'd started this school and done such a good job, uh, they wanted him to start a school at Westerbork. Uh, and the Dutch government was just building, was just, it was in transition. They were building the new camp at Westerbord, which we have been back to since then. Uh, and you may know that Westerbord was the camp, the transition camp, where every, in which they rounded up Jews from largely from Holland, but maybe from other countries. And every Tuesday, the train would leave for Auschwitz where that train load of people would be murdered. There are you know, many stories about the fact that there, they were, the people who got on the train were chosen by Jewish caretakers. Uh, and it was kind of terribly debilitating um, to know about that period. But when my father heard that, uh, he had a premonition that if he ended up if we ended up going to Westerbord, that uh, we were that something we would not we would not live, and so he had heard and that there was the Jewish Federation or whoever it was were uh, developing a priority system where everybody wanted to get out of there and go to the United States, but there wasn't enough room on the ships, and uh, you know it was hard to get a sponsor. In this country, there were people waiting, but there were still too many people who wanted to get out and there wasn't enough space. And so apparently they were developing this priority system for who would go. And he, there was a, there were these folks who were, 
who were doing that, who had an office in, on the ship. And my father said he decided finally that he would make it his business to go to find them. And, and, to, and he did. He learned where they were having their meetings or his meeting. And uh, one evening at the end of the day, when he felt that they were all through, he went there and he, and he were the, to the office, he knocked on the door and uh, the guy said, come in. And when he opened the door, uh, the man said, Rosenberg, what are you doing here? And it turned out to be the very same person who had gone fundraising with him in Magdeburg a few years earlier. And so uh, my father said, I'm here. Here's why I'm here and I want to get out. What? We have about maybe uh, about seven or eight minutes left because we want to give people time to ask questions. So oh, I thought we had a little more time. Okay, well, I'll quickly get through it then. Okay. And so this fellow said, Rosenberg, I'll see what I can do for you. <laughs> Whether he's the one that did it or not, I'm not sure. But we'd also learned that my parents no longer had any money and they, they had sold that ticket they'd had. And so highest paid for our ticket to come to this country. And that's why I always urge people to give money to highest and to others. And so we were on the last ship or virtually the last ship with passengers to leave Rotterdam. Uh, my the family in the family in Frankfurt was killed. The family in Rotterdam was killed. My uncle, my father's older brother, married in the concentration camp and was killed. His widow we met in Israel a few years later. His mother lived to about 1945 in a little town in Holland called Meppel. Then they picked her up and she was also murdered. And uh, so we were on the last ship. We landed at uh, New Jersey, not Ellis Island, on February 22nd, 1940. Uh, all the flags were out and we said, boy, what a nice welcome this is. We didn't know that it was President's Day. The flags weren't out for us, they were out for everybody, which was fine. We were met on the ship by some members of my mom's family, my sister. She gave me a quarter, said, take good care of it. So we ended up going eventually to Spartanburg, South Carolina, where my father was kind of a para rabbi for the congregations in Spartanburg and Gastonia, North Carolina. Um, on weekends, they didn't have a rabbi then. And he was sweeping floors in the textile mill during the week and gradually moved up in the textile industry. And we moved to Gastonia. I grew up in Gastonia, North Carolina in a segregated society. And uh, people always say, how, and I'll, I'll leave it. And then ended up going to Duke University and the University of North Carolina School of Law and uh, worked for the Civil Rights Division, Department of Justice, which is where I met Jean in the 1960s and uh, then came to Prestonburg in, in uh, here about 50 years ago. So I, I took a little longer with the Holocaust story. I didn't realize we were that close to running out of time, but I uh, hope that was, I uh, hope you were able to take that in. John, thank you so much, honestly, this was, no, I really was, I was hoping you would focus more on the Holocaust. I think that when I heard you the first time to do this presentation, uh, and now having heard you a second time do it, one of the things that always struck me, and it's not only you, but other people who have survived the Holocaust, who not necessarily had the same experience as you, uh, or even similar, but when they tell the story, for the most part, they tell it without emotion. They tell it as if it's like, this is what happened. It's, it was like, a, it was a matter of fact. Um, and it's always fascinated me that in terms of like, um, what do, what were you feeling as, you know, that little boy of seven years old when you, when you experienced Kristallnacht and about the whole idea of being sent off to your father's sister um, or having your father gone for a period, extended period of time. And the reality of how Jews are being treated 
and then juxtaposed to you living in North Carolina in a segregated, in a segregated world where they discriminated against people of color. John, before you answer, if you could um, close out your share screen so we can all see each other, that would be very helpful. I can do that. I can or Steve, that. either one of you. Yeah. Thought I could do it. Let's no, see. I think John has to do it. If not, John, just answer. It's fine. No, no, it's, tell me what to do and I'll do it. How do I close this thing out? Yeah, you have to close it. Let's see. Uh, so just leave it, and I think talking is more important. Well, I mean, I, you should just be able to go to the side where it says, you know, cl file close or something like that. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. <laughs> now you see everybody. Oh, there's our friends from Huntington. The Muffsons are there. Yep. yep. <laughs> heard this before, and their son Michael's in your congregation, and I've spoken to them. That's how I actually got the contact. I got it from Michael's parents to Michael to Rabbi War uh, Garden Schwartz to me. So that, <laughs> that's how it happened. Well, it's Great. Much, nice, much nicer to look at your faces and the and the PowerPoint. Uh, you know, I think that's a hard question to answer in a way because. Um, as far as Kristallnacht goes, my mother said that my own reaction was to say, alles kaput, alles kaput, everything is broken. Um, and to be, and I think that, that probably tells the tale. The, you know, come, beyond that, as a seven-year-old, you're just following your parents and in and the trip to this country on the ship was probably was really an adventure for a seven year old. Among other things, I saw the first colorized movie in the United States that was out. It was The Wizard of Oz. And you didn't have to know much English to be able to understand the plot. Um, and, um, and, you know, I, I, I'm not sure then when when we lived in New York for the first six months before we went to South Carolina, I went to PS 132, the public school with a bunch of other kids who were from other countries, perhaps more German there, but where they were teaching, trying to teach us school and a little bit of English. Although I think I learned most of my English on the street, playing stickball with other kids from that area who in Washington Heights are used to, you know, other children coming who are all mostly Jewish neighborhood. But um, I, as far as a segregated society is concerned, most of you, if you might want to read the Jew store sometime, is that most of their the grandparents came as peddlers to these small, small uh, Southern communities. And then their children during the war years opened stores and lived, most of them were fairly well off. Um, and the, that's the way the segregated society operated. And I think they were all trying to buck the tide and start talking about integration it was like, well, we're gonna have our, they'll burn our stores down. We're not gonna change the society uh, back in those days. And I tend to say my parents would have been happy no matter what kind of society they plunked us down in, as long as we were safe and they were able to raise their children. Um, looking back, of course, then I later did spend much of many years eventually trying to help undo that caste system in the South, which needed to be done and uh, which still needs lots of work um, in this day and time. So, uh, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm very fortunate. I think my parents were very, as many immigrants are, very patriotic. Um, I told the story that, you know, they studied for their citizenship test uh, for, for after five years, you can you go to the United States Federal Courthouse. We went to Charlotte, North Carolina. And after that particular 
e event, we went across the street to a place called the Piedmont Diner to have lunch. And it was the first time in five, first time the family had ever eaten out because uh, we didn't have any money. And we didn't know what eating, I've never, never been to a restaurant uh, to speak of, at least with my mom and dad. I mean, they wouldn't spend money on food that they could make for themselves, but it was a great day in the family to have them become citizens. And uh, just as an aside, I mean, when in the early 40s, because we were aliens, one day it was the FBI or whoever came to the house and they picked up our shortwave radio. I think they had a dad, they had a radio, which also had a shortwave thing. And my father had a monocular. He had somewhere along the way, somebody had given him one of these very long uh, monoculars that sea captains and the like used. And, uh, and they took it. And they were very embarrassed because my parents on the wall had Franklin Roosevelt's picture, as most immigrants did. And uh, they realized that this was a very patriotic family. And, and they were quite embarrassed by it all. And after the war, they, got, they gave it, it all came back. But um, I think, uh, I mean, that's a longer answer you might have wanted. I don't know how much time you have for questions. I'm happy to do it. We have a few minutes. Anyone? So feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, OK. Looks like they will either board everybody to tears or <laughs> so, so I'm interested, John. This is Terry. You have a, a very you you had a very large family. Um, you and your brother survived. Were there other family members that survived? And well, my sister was born in this country. I have oh. a sister in Raleigh who uh -huh. was an architect and then became went to law school at age 50. Uh, <laughs> and my brother, uh, my brother. Um, was a is a demographer he worked for the National Institute of Health for many years uh, as a the head of the, he started in natality he would say and ended up in mortality and <laughs> was the head of the mortality statistics section of uh, NIH for many years and then he had uh, his first marriage he had two boys one of whom I mentioned is a PhD is uh, Dan Rosenberg is out in Oregon. He's getting ready to go to Berlin again for a year with his family. Mm -hmm. He's a historian, and uh, his other son is also a PhD in the Federal Reserve. You can blame him or give him credit <laughs> for the economics of the day. So your family is truly a, a, a microcosm, just a, a little picture of, you know, um, of success of, of all these souls that we lost, what could have been. And luckily, your family survived and has achieved much. So well, you should be very proud, um, including yourself, obviously. <laughs> but uh, well, you I know, think we are. I th I think we really do appreciate what we what this country has meant for us, and uh, it needs to. It's got a lot of work yet to be done, but there's no other place like it. And, uh, I've really appreciated the people I've worked with in the Justice Department and in the Air Force and, uh, and in legal services. And, and yeah, could you just tell us a little bit about your legal services work? I mean, that's amazing in its own right. <laughs> well, uh, the unique thing about legal services, we provide help in civil matters to low income people who can't afford a lawyer. And so the major Part of that is uh, our cases like consumer protection, foreclosures, family law matters. Uh, you, you will have a legal services agency where you are. I don't know the one in Newton specifically. There's Massachusetts Legal Aid. I had a couple of lawyers who worked for me a few years ago who were in the western part of Massachusetts. Um, I think I mentioned it before, Steve. But in any event, um, uh, Public benefits, uh, SNAP these days, a lot of family law, veterans, elderly, elderly, uh, a variety of people. What I, but when I came here initially, 
because this was a single economy country, their coal uh, is the bane and the benefit of this area. So we have a lot of, we came to address the issues of coal mining. So you have coal miners who worked underground and had black lung disease. You have coal miners who were working on safe conditions and complain, uh, who were being fired, where non-union jobs needed representation when they, when they were working in unsafe conditions and, and wanted to complain. You have a federal right to complain and a federal right to safe work conditions. And uh, then really the, the larger issue, especially in those days of the environmental damages caused by surface mining, by strip mining these mountains, which at that time the courts had held, it was very difficult for property owners to stop strip mining on their property because of the way the courts had, construct, had con, just constructed these deeds. Uh, and also the coal companies weren't paying any real property taxes. And there's a whole lot of coal related issues, some of which are still ongoing today. That's uh, too bad. <laughs> so, okay. But I thank uh, you. The, so I left that and I've worked really most of the last few years with nonprofit groups in this, in this area and uh, worked with the American Bar Association trying to get private attorneys to devote some of their time because legal services only meets a small, it's federal funding is very limited, state funding, so they need help. We try to recruit volunteer lawyers. So there is a, it's a great, area to spend time on. Spend oh, don't, time. don't stop. <laughs> well, thank um, you so much. Well, there are also the counterpart on the criminal side of the public defenders who do a wonderful job uh, representing people when it's not when they're the least popular person in the courtroom. Uh, but in this country, we do have the rule of law. I'd like to say um, that's what makes this country great. And uh, you may never, you may not be uh, proud of the particular nominees that made it to the Supreme Court. But, you know, when push came to shove, it's that court that threw, that wouldn't listen to Mr. Trump. I mean, in the end, uh, that <laughs> court, as it is composed by his nominees, uh, sent him packing uh, when, it, when it came to these many ch challenges that he, that he mounted. So I'm uh, proud of our justice system and uh, try to spend some time doing that. John, can... thank you so much. Really, we really appreciate it. Um, and, um, I would really like to, uh, I look forward to actually hearing you about your, your career and how you met Gene and how the two of you worked as civil rights attorneys in the Justice Department and your experiences then. Because um, I would imagine it wouldn't involve just like specific civil rights, but the civil rights of everybody, whether no matter what color or religion they were, some of the experiences that you had um, that really do, do demonstrate how great this country really is um, and what potential it has for even being greater. So we really thank you and really appreciate it. Um, it's a mitzvah to continue to do these kinds of things and we really appreciate it. So thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna ask Stan Steinberg to, uh, Stan wanted to do a, a couple of promos, of PR announcements. So Stan, take it away. Thank you, thank you. So, so I wanna say thank you, uh, John. And uh, it was fascinating to hear you because when we visited Poland and Israel on the March of the Living Trip, many of us who are on this uh, Zoom tonight, uh, we were visiting what was history and the past. And you've helped me to see what was possible uh, in, in even very few instances and in, in the work you've done. And I think it's very commendable. So uh, that's wonderful. And I just want to say, I appreciate your time this evening. Uh, one, one of the things that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I would, I would like to say we now have a very uh, impressive Holocaust and Humanities Center in Cincinnati, which is uh, three hours from where we are. It's not as well known, it's very small in a yeshiva for a number of years in an outside of Cincinnati, but it's now moved to the train station, which is a former train station. It's a really worth visiting. I, I don't know, I suppose you have one in Boston. Is there a Holocaust Museum in Boston? There is. 
and, and I just have to say, and I don't know if this is something you care for, but I used to live in Cincinnati and we went to Skyline Chili all the time. Oh yeah. And it was pretty good stuff. So anyway, anybody who knows that knows that. So, so I just wanna add that last, uh, last uh, fall, we did three sessions on Yiddish and they were sort of a quick outgrowth of having been on the adult education committee with Terry. And as a result of that, I started to think about what other programs could be developed. So there are three things coming up that I wanted to let everyone know about. You've probably seen this in the Temple Bulletin, but the first one is a week from tonight. It's Hank Isnetsky, who is the founder and director of the Klezmer Conservatory Band and works at the Boston Conservatory. And he's really going to talk about music uh, post uh, World War II and how it, the, the resurgence of that uh, contemporary Yiddish music and culture. And it, it really is, I've listened to the tape of what he's going to talk about, and it fits very nicely as a uh, kind of a continuation of some of the things that you've talked about. After that, two weeks later, we'll have Marissa Scheinfeld, who I saw a presentation of her. She, she did a photo essay of the Catskills in New York, which was an area where there were lots of uh, resorts where there was Yiddish theater and comedy and families went and vacationed there. There were the um, communities of huts and, and there were many people in the Northeast who have fond memories of that area, the Neville, the Catskills, Grossingers and other places. Her work was to go back there and photograph these places today. So it's things like weeds growing out of the cracks of, of swimming pools and bedrooms left in the place they were when the places were abandoned in the 1960s, and then comparing that to historical pictures and talking about her experience there. And I just loved her presentation. I saw it through the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts. And then the final presentation, and again, this is more about the arts than the language. Um, this is from the um, National Center for Jewish Film at Brandeis University, which is not affiliated with Brandeis, but lives there and they are responsible for keeping Jewish film alive. And so uh, Sharon uh, Revo, who is the founder, along with her daughter now working there, she's going to be presenting uh, on that subject of, of Jewish, Jewish film and some of the films that they have taken and restored. And uh, uh, they just had a big event at the Lincoln Center this year. So very exciting. So these are three great speakers. Uh, many of you probably know Hank Isnetsky and um, he's a great guy and, and a good guy for us <laughs> to lead off with. So uh, those okay. are available to you to sign up and please feel free. Thank okay, you. I'm going to take it off over from Stan. Uh, this is Terry again. Um, I just want to thank Stan and Steve for bringing us this program. A lot of the things that we do through adult learning um, is because somebody in the congregation sends me an email or calls me or whatever and says, you've got to do this. Okay, so I want to tell you about a couple of other things that are coming up as well. One that starts this Thursday night, which is called Daf Yomi, which is um, daily study of Talmud. And we're going to, we did a taste of Talmud. That was brought to us by Cindy Paisner, who's on the call. Um, and we're, it's a twice weekly uh, for three weeks, um, studying with this amazing woman, Leah. I can't remember her last name, but anyway, Leah, who's an amazing teacher. And we have room. So if you'd like to, it's 45 minutes quick, twice a week to study Talmud in English. Um, she's, she makes it very clear. So if you're interested, all these things are on the Temple website. They're all in the email that you got today, the newsletter. Um, moving on, uh, next Monday, uh, Tuesday night, where Rabbi Eliza Berger is, uh, you can join her with um, uh, um, Spurtis. Uh, Institute in Chicago is offering some uh, program called Critical Conversations about race um, with Jews of color. Um, the speakers are outstanding, so it doesn't cost. It's free to Temple Emanuel members. All the information is on the website. Um, and then this is sort of an outgrowth from, from the Holocaust, which I think is fascinating, also brought to us by Hannah Meyer. Um, there's a program uh, organization in Poland called Forum for Dialogue, non-Jews, okay, who are trying to keep the Polish Jewish connection alive and foster dialogue among Jew the, the Jews that live there still 
and the Polish community to better understand what went on. And so the director of that program is coming to speak to us on uh, in May 2nd. And finally, this is another one. Um, another person in this congregation passed this on to me. Um, a, it's actually a friend of mine, this guy named Phil Goff, who lives in Arlington, who's a city planner. And he is going to talk about the Jewish roots in Boston, okay, how that came about and how we move from city to city, you know, from Dorchester and whatever, Chelsea and all those other places. Um, I've seen his presentation, it's fascinating. So A, come and be part of all this stuff, but also B, if something comes across that, you, that you've attended recently and are interested in um, bringing to Temple Emmanuel, please just get in touch with me. Um, so there's, there's so much more. Um, and thank you for coming tonight. And thank you muchly to John and to Steve and to Stan. And we look forward to studying and learning more together. All right. Everybody be safe, stay well. And John, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Bye, Jean. Good night, all. Good night.